um, dressing room. I've always taken um, um, sartorialism to be an art form. What have we got in here? This, one of my favourite things, this is uh, Mr. Darcy's dressing gown. Not the actual dressing gown in Pride and Prejudice, but uh, exactly the same model, which was made by the same company that made his. I happened to know a lady who worked there, and she got it made up for me. So, I mean, this is something that anyone can do in particular. This is a Georgian coat made in um, Donegal tweed. I love Donegal tweed. It's the hippie's tweed. Here, it's got these sparkles of, of colour in it. It's amazing stuff. It's actually, you know, it's interesting how clothing is more something for other people than it is for yourself, because when you're wearing it, you can't see it. It's other people who are seeing it. And I've always found it makes a nice um, connection with other human beings. People are always saying hello to me. It, it creates a lot of friendliness in life that, mm. that I enjoy. You get lots of nice comments from ladies about your hats as yes. well, don't you? Mm. Yeah. Of course, there's a, a, we have our Tibetan robes that we have a variety of different things, but... Um, but I generally enjoy wearing you know, traditional clothing, but from all varieties of cultures. Um, I, I've got some various items of Hasidic clothing, a nice Hasidic silk jacket that I bought in one of the shops in Borough Park in New York. That, um, I remember when I was first in New York, I went, um, one of my first students there, I asked him, I said, who are these guys at the airport that dress really sharp, you know? And he said, well, describe them. I said, well, they're all in black. And they have a black hat, white shirt. And I said, they've got these little bits of hair here. And he looked at me and he said, sharp? <laughs> he said, you must be joking. I said, no, I think they're really sharp. Uh, he's Jewish also, but he, he had no way of understanding these people as being sharp. And I said, yeah, I love the way they dress, you know, it's really, they've got real style, those people. And that came as a shock to him that anyone would find the Hasidim sharp. But... This here is um, a pair of lederhosen, but they're um, carpenters. Lederhosen. So they're long. They don't make them anymore. I had a pair when I was young that belonged to my uncle. I got them made up again by a gentleman in Austria who fortunately knew what I was talking about and was able to remake them. And then on top I've got a thing that's entirely untraditional, which is uh, the six-pocket waistcoat, which is my particular creation because I like having a, a walking filing cabinet. You mentioned the impact on others is, is primary but does it give you a certain feeling to dress that way? Yeah, it gives me a sense that I'm relieving people of what would other be the horrid experience of seeing me. <laughs> <laughs> they get something slightly more pleasant to look at. But there is an aspect of practice in all this, that um, if you wear certain clothes, it makes you behave. Well, you take on a different demeanour. Not that you behave differently, exactly, but you have a different... You walk differently. I think for you to walk in your shamtab, it makes you walk differently, doesn't it, because you're wearing a skirt. Mm -hmm. And um, it's connected with the practice of um, what we would call wearing the body of visions, which is actually wearing the appearance of the yidam. Um, because one's whole world is connected with practice. Um, if you're engaged in visualisation practice of a yidam in, down in the shrine room and you finish your practice and you get up and walk away, you don't leave that behind. You take it out into the world with you as much as possible. So I think the, the connection with clothing is, is connected with moving into that practice.
It's also about appreciation, and it goes into cooking, it goes into every aspect of life. That um, I think one of the things that is not really understood concerning compassion is that compassion is not simply wanting the whole world to have a cookie. Uh, it is appreciative. One of the things that's important in... Um, in terms of compassion, can be seen really in the advice they give you uh, as a counsellor. That if you ever get a client you don't like, you have to refer that client because you can't help a person you don't like. So it's important that you appreciate your client, otherwise you can't help. Um, so there's this communicative aspect that, that, that goes through all the arts, which is why clothing is an art, uh, especially in terms of Vajrayana, I think in the West there used to be this, I, I think there still is a, a divide between art and craft, that art is something high and craft is looked down upon. Um, that wouldn't be the case with Vajrayana. That everything that is created, whether it's perfume, whether it's food, whatever it is, poetry, painting, dance, uh, they're all arts and they're all equal there's no hierarchy of the senses. Uh, there's no hierarchy also for concept consciousness in terms of what is written as poetry or what is created in that way. So um, one of the things that both Konzang Dojo Rinpoche and Dojo Rinpoche emphasized was that uh, you know, to be a Vajrayana practitioner is to be an artist. And so it's, it's important to explore the arts not everyone is going to be that wonderful at every art, but um, what everybody has is a place that they live and clothes that they put on. So this is a basic thing in which anyone can invest if they want to. And it doesn't have to be expensive either. You know, I, I, I wouldn't like anyone to get the idea that um, it costs a lot to do this. You simply have to iron your trousers. Um, having had a German mother, I starch everything. <laughs> uh, you know, I like to get the shirts like cardboard. You know, uh, <laughs> can, you, can you say a bit more about um, uh, the connection between wearing the, wearing the appearance of the Yidam and clothing, or maybe just how one does carry that? Um, body of the yidam off of the cushion that you were describing there? Well, I think that uh, the main point is that uh, care and attention are taken and that you explore your appreciative faculties uh, to the best of your ability. This naturally leads on to um, becoming an individual, the older I get, the more, I, well, both of us realize that most of the world is driven by fashion. Uh, fashions in everything, fashions in politics, fashions in religion. You can see it at the moment. You can almost tell who's going to be the anti-Brexit person because you, all you have to know is their background and you're going to know what they vote. And, you, uh, and it makes us wonder, how much have you thought about this in either direction, either for or against? So there's a fashion for, a fashion against. There seems to be a fashion for everything. And it's breaking out of those fashions uh, by learning how to appreciate, how to become an individual by actually allowing the sense fields to function you know, looking at things and wondering what your relationship with them is, not in an intellectual way, but simply colour, form, whatever it is. And once you start to appreciate, then you can become an individual. Having become an individual, then that becomes apparent to other people and the compassion of the whole situation is what sparks people off into things. Um, we have a student um, in California who, for most of his life, has desired a Jimi Hendrix jacket. You know, the green one with the frogging that actually belongs to a veterinary corps. Um, 
And so one day I said to him, you know, why not just buy it? You know? And he thought this was a sort of a rather outrageous idea because it was fairly expensive. I said, well, you're going to wear it for the rest of your life, aren't you? Uh, you're probably going to wear it out, so is it expensive? And so he finally went for it. And um, he's had a fascinating time with it. On aircraft, everywhere, people speak to him, wherever he goes. Uh, and so a whole wealth of human communication has opened up there. And uh, the interesting thing is it's not a thing I'd wear. Well, it's not that I'd reject wearing it. If you gave it to me, I'd wear it. But I mean, but I love seeing him in it. So it's not that it, it has to be something you'd want to wear, but you see somebody else wearing something that expresses what they are, and that's communicative. And that is all part of bodhicitta, because bodhicitta is vast. It's not just contained in uh, moral, ethical, altruistic principles. It's pervasive. Uh, it's a natural phenomenon. You know, it's not... It doesn't only exist as this codified thing of wanting all beings to achieve realisation. That is a really narrow view of it. Of course it's that. But it's far more than that in that it permeates everything. And the more in tune with it you become, the more powerful it, it, it gets. Mm. And this is what I meant about leaving the cushion behind. Because in your life, the more reminders you have about practice, the better. So the idea of um, walking away from the shrine room as Pamas and Bhavri or Yeshit Sogyal, that then alters the way that you behave in life. Um, and it's the circumstances of your life that are the reminders to practice.